back to Wire to Wire with Nolan RECC. I'm Sarah Fellows, Communications Manager, and I'm here once again with Nolan's President and CEO, Greg Lee. Thanks for joining me, Greg. No problem. Glad to be here. Yeah, it's good to see you. Um, I know we've had a little bit of a rocky start trying to get this on a regular schedule uh, because of, of course, everything that's happening in the world. We really launched this right before COVID kind of hit. So uh, mm -hmm. we've had kind of an odd schedule with it, but, uh, but we're getting back on track and uh, we're hoping to do this every month if we can, uh, at least every other month, right? Exactly. Yeah, it's been an interesting year to try to get a podcast off the ground. So this is episode three and it's what, six or seven months after the first right. episode. Exactly. Exactly. Um, we kind of figured out this format works okay. So we'll do this for a while. Right. And I think when we talked initially about trying to do this, it was something on the order of, you know, once a month. Mm -hmm. uh, so from this point forward, once a month, once every six weeks, we're going to try to get another one of these out. Yeah. Hopefully it's educational and we'll just see where it goes from here. Absolutely. And, you know, if people are, are uh, tuning in and they really want to hear about something that we haven't talked about. Uh, all they have to do is just let us know and we'll uh, we'll get that on the schedule, too. Yep, that'd be great. All right. So this one is a big topic I really wanted to address early on because outages, of course, is a big part of, of what we have to address um, for our members, uh, power restoration. So we're really going to kind of take everybody through that process today. So I appreciate you letting me kind of pick your brain about that. Um, but we're going to start with a safety moment. And uh, we do that, obviously, because safety is a huge part of, of what we do. It's a primary focus for us. Uh, in September is National Preparedness Month. And uh, really when we're talking around outages and power restoration, a lot kind of falls back on our members and ourselves about being prepared if there is an outage. Um, a lot of times we can't avoid that for, for one reason or another, usually because of a big weather event. And so we wanna make sure that our members are prepared in advance of that uh, so that it's, it's as not uncomfortable as possible. They can uh, make it through it until they can, we can get our power uh, back on. And some of the things that uh, Red Cross and Ready.gov recommend is to have a, a kit. Uh, those kits are really important for maintaining the health and safety of your family during maybe an outage event or a big weather event. And some of the things that, that are really good to keep in those is um, um, a first aid kit, medication for a couple of days in case you can't get out to get your medication, uh, extra hygiene supplies, those kinds of things, radio, flashlight, batteries. Of course, most of us have a smartphone that kind of functions as all of that. So having maybe a battery charger that you can plug in uh, your devices to is, is helpful. Non-perishable food items. Don't forget a can opener if you have cans in there. Uh, water for everybody in your house for several days, including pets. And then a way, if you do have medical equipment, and we'll talk about this in a little bit, if you have medical equipment that you rely on, a way to, to back that up. So those are just a few things that the Red Cross and the um, government agencies recommend having on hand. And being prepared now before anything happens is really important. Uh, thinking about that once a storm hits is, is not obviously super helpful. So um, make sure you're prepared for or any big events that might come up. So that's our safety moment. Uh, and I'm gonna start kind of turning this over to you. Um, again, we're talking about power restoration and outages. And the first thing I really wanted you to speak to is what are some of the elements that, that can cause an outage? Obviously we referred a little bit to weather, uh, but what are, what are some of the actual physical things that cause outages to happen? Right. So really uh, problems for our system can manifest in a number of different weather related ways. Ice is something that we we talk about being devastating for us in this part of the in this part of the country. Mm -hmm. So we build our system to certain specifications to be able to withstand certain weather events. And what that means is when we build a line, the poles and the structures and the conductors are designed so that they can withstand a certain amount of weight from ice, a certain amount of force from um, wind blowing at a certain speed and obviously the more stuff that you have on a pole the more surface area it has the more place there is for weight to gather and it's more resistance if in fact wind is blowing against against it so there's a lot of factors that go into what sort of weather events can affect our system but ice is really the biggest concern in this part of the world to a lesser degree a heavy wet snow can from time to time cause us challenges. Usually a powdery snow, not much of a problem, but if you get a really heavy wet slushy snow, sometimes that can gather on lines. 
Uh, so that weight can be a bit of an issue. Uh, additionally, we also have lightning concerns and wind concerns. So both part and parcel to thunderstorms. Um, typically the rain itself is not a major problem. There are certain remote uh, and limited spaces on our system where there are some flooding concerns, but by and large, rain itself is not a major contributing factor to outages. Uh, but if we focus on lightning and wind, wind is pretty obvious. Um, now typically the wind in and of itself does not do extremely uh, significant damage to our infrastructure, but wind causes trees and other debris to blow over. Uh, so you have a combination of um, all the factors involved in a thunderstorm with a lot of rain and wind. Trees can uproot, they can blow over, they can break off. Tree gets close to our line. Lots of times we have me se severe mechanical damage because of uh, tree debris falling on our lines that can break conductors, that can break poles. Unfortunately, what happens a lot of times is you break one pole, you start having a domino effect down the line because of the uh, intensive force that is experienced on that entire assembly and that entire system all at one time. Um, it's a difficult thing to overcome. Now, lightning, uh, lightning is also an issue. Um, typically, lightning has some more specific and um, usually more quickly treatable outcomes. So there are certain sacrificial devices that we have in our system, whether that is a fuse, uh, whether that is a lightning arrester, there are certain things that are designed to protect our assets and infrastructure uh, in the event of a lightning strike directly on a pole, a line, et cetera. So when that happens, it may damage uh, a lightning arrestor or it may blow a fuse, but oftentimes we can send a man out and as long as there are no other mechanical uh, concerns with the, with the system and with the infrastructure, those things can usually be resolved in a matter of minutes to half an hour. Uh, but when you have that wind issue that causes a tree problem or that ice issue that the weight causes a strain on the system, you're going to get into bigger problems that take a lot longer to resolve, unfortunately. Right. And we're talking about over 3,000 miles of line, too. So that's that just mm -hmm. amplifies what we're talking about. All right. Well, right. Um, so when a member has a power outage, uh, back in, you know, the old days, um, there were you know, you had to call in and, and let us know that you had an outage because we didn't necessarily know. But uh, we have a lot more technology now, uh, which to me is one of the things that was so fascinating uh, when I joined here, when I came on at Nolan, um, how much we can understand about our system uh, from here, from, from the office. So can you talk a little bit about how do, how do we know when a, a member's power is out? Sure. Well, the first thing to keep in mind is that we have a dispatch center here at our main office in Elizabethtown that's staffed 24-7. So there is always at least one person who is actively engaged with our system to monitor all activity and make sure that things are working properly, or if they're not, they are figuring out who they need to call or what we need to do to try to resolve a concern. The way that they are eminently informed about issues on our system is our AMI system. So that is an advanced metering system that has individual meters on people's homes or business that have a lot of intelligence in them. So we've got roughly, I think just south of 6,000 meters at this point in time. And by and large, almost every single one of them has um, an amount of intelligence within it that it reports very regularly um, on a matter of every few seconds to every 15 minute interval, every hourly interval, it records data and then it sends that back to what is called an access point. So we serve predominantly Hardin and LaRue County in the outskirts of a few other counties. And across our service territory, we have 67 access points. So each of those nearly 30,000 meters sends its data back to one of these 67 access points. Those access points um, are cellular enabled. 
So that data moves from the antenna on the access point, and then there's a cellular backhaul to get it back to our GE portal where all of that information goes and it helps us identify if there's trouble in the system. Mm -hmm. So if you have for any reason an outage at your home or at your business, after very limited latency of a few seconds, that meter sends its data to the access point, the access point sends it via cellular back to the GE portal and it pops up on the computer screen in front of the dispatcher. Mm -hmm. So almost without fail, we know in a matter of seconds when there's a power outage. Right. Now, out of 36,000 at any given time, there are maybe a handful of meters that for whatever reason, they're in a low spot or there's a lot of vegetation between that meter and the nearest access point, they won't call in properly. But we, we know when that is an issue too. Uh, and we will handle those on a manual basis if necessary, but that is very, very limited. I'm talking like maybe, maybe a handful out of 36,000. So not a major concern, um, but that's how we get a lot of very good data that helps us to make uh, data-driven decisions as to how best restore our system whenever we have a storm event or, or an outage. So uh, we know that um, a lot of people feel better about being able to call in. Uh, so they can, um, they can do that. And, and there are ways that we can let you know, even by text, um, that, that we know that you have an outage um, and by phone and those kinds of things. So can you talk a little bit about that? What, what happens if they still decide to call in? Well, one of, the, one of the challenging things for us during a major weather event is just the sheer volume of calls that we receive. We're typically in a position where we need to dedicate as much manpower as we can to the actual act of physical restoration of the system, rather than committing those resources to answering some of those calls that may be coming in. Now, at the same time, we're not saying we don't wanna to talk to you, and we're not saying that we, we don't wanna give you information, but we are trying to automate as many elements of that as we can to give you good information via text alerts or email alerts that can be received through Smart Hub uh, or by using an IVR uh, system within our phone book so that uh, any member can leave information that may give us a little bit of a description about what they were experiencing without actually having to have the person-to-person -person dialogue to retrieve that information. Right. We're trying to build in efficiencies. Um, it, is, it is imperfect to try to get all that data. It's imperfect if we do talk to you. It's imperfect if we try to automate it. We're trying to make it as good as we possibly can, though. Um, you know, I know one of the things that did not work as well as I wanted it to during the last major ice storm in 2018, there were several cases of um, the automated system identifying for folks who called in to get a status update about their home or their meter, they were told their power was restored when in fact it had not been. Right. We spent some intentional time trying to figure out exactly why that was going on and what can we do to resolve it. Well, one of the things that happens whenever we have a widespread outage is there is a, there is a predictive model that uses that very specific data received from each meter to try to identify how many folks are actually out. So let's say that let's say that your home is in a subdivision with 30 other people and you all are all fed off the same no lend line. Okay. So if 26 of those meters call in and identify, I have a power failure situation our predictive model is going to say that entire line is off. But what can happen sometimes is when that is restored, there may be two or three or four of those folks who have a more specific acute issue that is preventing them from having a restoration. So you may have 27 of the 30 that are back on, but now our system has predicted that entire line is back on. Within a few minutes, we know of the, the uh, one or two or three individual cases that those folks actually do not power, but then we have to go in and manually adjust that predictive model. So we know 
we're gonna work on restoration, but there is a window of time there when in fact, that information that is received through the automated system may be imperfect. So that's something that we've spent some specific um, intentional time trying to resolve. And I feel like that is something that is much better, but those are some of the inherent challenges of dealing with um, an outage of, of a magnitude of thousand, 10,000, 15,000 people. There's just a lot of moving parts and you put as many good systems in place as you can and you deal with the things that aren't exactly like you want them because by and large it does work and it works well. Right. And the problems, like you said, that we've seen typically are because it's a larger outage, um, those, those bigger outages. And, and if people are calling in um, and sometimes phones can get, you know, too busy because we have too many people calling in, but really those are the kinds of things that we see so infrequently because of the huge number of outages we just don't get that usually happening right. so um, right. a typical day, day any, when we, yeah when we would have a small outage we wouldn't see a lot of these same issues right so most of the time when we're sitting here in the office we have exactly zero people without electricity but on any day you have a rain shower blow through you've got a little bit of gust of wind a small thunderstorm um, you may have three five a dozen two dozen folks those are pretty easy to manage. Even when you get up into 100, 150, 200 folks, it's not that difficult to manage. When you start getting into those four digit numbers and larger, there's a lot more moving parts and we have to, we have to take on some more resources to be able to take care of that. But on a day-to-day -day basis, it's not bad. So you've alluded to a lot of that kind of the process of what happens, but is there any other part of that process when, so when we get the information from a member's meter that it, it is without power, kind of take us a little bit through that process. What happens? Um, obviously you said we have a 24 hour dispatch, so dispatch is going to be, you know, they're going to be that primary recipient of that information, but then what happens after that? So the first thing that the dispatcher will do is, they will get the immediate alert that we have a power failure on a specific meter. And at that point, they will go in and for, you know, 60 to 90 seconds, maybe a couple of minutes, they'll analyze the data that was received from that meter. And sometimes they can tell, okay, this might be the specific concern versus a larger issue. Uh, and depending on, again, the predictive model, depending on how many meters have reported, we can usually tie that back to this is an individual issue or it's going to identify for us that the nearest common upstream device has opened up. And that's why we have a number of meters that are affected in a group. Mm -hmm. um, a subconscious review by the dispatcher at that particular time as to what are the ambient weather conditions is gonna shed a lot of light on what the issue may be. If it is a clear sky day, nothing is going on maybe it's a wildlife concern that has caused the problem um, obviously if the wind is blowing uh, if there's lightning in the area deductive reasoning would tell you that's probably associated with whatever the uh, with whatever the problem is mm -hmm. regardless of what it is within a number of minutes after we receive that outage and do a very cursory review of the information that is available to us the dispatcher is going to contact one of our on-call personnel. Mm -hmm. So at any given time, a few of our linemen are on call for, for a week at a time. So they will, they are tasked with responding to any issues that we have outside of normal working hours. Uh, they will be dispatched from their home on the week that they're on call. They drive Nolan truck home so that they can respond immediately without having to come to the office. Um, and they will be on their way. Mm -hmm. And if in course of um, their travel there, the dispatcher receives more information, either they get a call um, or get uh, information from that account holder or anyone else who heard a loud bang or saw something or see something sparking, they will pass information on to the lineman while he is en route. Um, and then we have a, a radio system that throughout the entire uh, restoration process, the dispatcher and the lineman stay in constant contact with each other about what is going on, any perceived safety concerns, whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. Another thing that happens fairly frequently, too frequently for our liking, is 
will have one of these outages. It will affect several folks. Uh, there is no weather circumstance to identify to us a, a direct cause. And shortly after the dispatcher sends the lineman in route to go see what the concern is, we will get a call from 911 that a car is at a pole or a, uh, or a semi truck has, has snagged into a telecom conductor and broke a pole off. Mm -hmm. uh, those really stink, uh, but it's just part of doing business, I guess. Mm -hmm. Um, so when when there is an event and um, say a weather event, I know sometimes uh, things can happen to a person's service that actually is on their property. Um, and and one of the things that we I think is really really important is educating our members and the public about what is ours um, and and what is actually a member's property. So can you talk a little bit about that on, on a residential service drop? I, I love the terminology, I'm still learning. Uh, but on a residential service drop, what is what is an actual member's property uh, that they would be responsible for and what is uh, Nolan's property that we're actually responsible for? Sure, well, I will say this from personal experience and then from things that I know that I hear from our guys as well. There is There is little that is more rewarding than being able to make a restoration for one of our members during an outage event. Mm -hmm. There is little that feels worse than having to walk away from one of those concerns with it unresolved because that individual has damage to their own assets that is just beyond the jurisdiction of no lender resolve. Okay. Uh, that is a horrible feeling and it's often very difficult to get that member to understand why we are walking away from this. It's not because we want to, um, and it's not because we're derelict in what we're supposed to do. If there are, if there are things that have to be resolved by an electrician that are um, the responsibility of the member, we, we legally cannot engage in that. So we have to step back and wait till those things are resolved, and then we will do everything we can to make sure that we get them hooked back up. But specific to actual items, um, we, this, is a, this is a document, it's called a notice of disconnection. Um, and what we will use this for is if we come up on, let's just say a home after a thunderstorm and a tree has fallen on that service line and it has ripped the, um, it has ripped the mass in some, the mast and some of the uh, pipe riser uh, and that member owned infrastructure off the side of the house. Unfortunately, that's one of those we have to walk away from because there's stuff there that we, it's, it's, not, it's not our responsibility to repair and we can't do that because it's not owned by us. It's not our plant asset. So um, probably the highlights, if you have an overhead service, a weatherhead, uh, an attachment point, um, a, a meter base itself, um, those are things that are the members' infrastructure and their responsibility. Now, the, the service wire that runs from a pole or a transformer to the weatherhead is Nolan's responsibility, and the meter itself is Nolan's responsibility. But some of those other things, they're, they're not ours. Unfortunately, a lot of members don't know that until we have one of these circumstances and their first awareness is when we're telling them, we need you to get this fixed before we can come back and hook everything back up. Uh, hate that. It's a miserable feeling, especially when it's after a thunderstorm and it's 98 degrees outside and with, you know, 90% humidity or when we've had an ice storm and it's 10 degrees outside. Um, it, it stinks, but it's, it's one of those things that we, we try to navigate through. We do as much as we can to help our members within reason, but sometimes those things are just a little bit beyond our control. Right. And now uh, we will have, we do have on our website, uh, kind of a diagram that shows um, if, if people are like me and, and don't necessarily know what a weatherhead is, um, they can look on that diagram on our website and it shows what part of their service is actually their property and what is Nolan's property. So if that helps, um, we encourage people to take a look at that on our website as well, so. Yes, yeah. If you can preemptively educate yourself in that regard, probably will help all parties involved in case, in case we have one of these very unfortunate circumstances. Right, right. Um, one of the other questions that we get, I, I wanted to ask. Um, so it, I'm in a neighborhood and my side of the street, uh, well, we all lost power maybe, um, and my side of the street came on 
but my neighbors didn't or vice versa, or, or I have power and my neighbor doesn't. Um, what, how does that happen? Uh, what's, what's something that, how can we help people understand why that happens? I think maybe to most simply explain that we could think of it in, in maybe two different ways. So the first and most obvious uh, would be that if, if you are without power and those around you have power, that may very well speak to you having a very specific localized issue that it's only affecting you. Um, so sometimes we will see an individual account affected. Very often we will see all accounts fed from the same transformer affected. So if we have a transformer failure or um, a fuse blows, a transformer fuse that blows, it's going to affect everyone on that transformer. So that may be one home, it may be two, it may be three or four. Uh, in rare cases, it may be a few more than that. Mm -hmm. uh, but that would, that would demonstrate why you or you and a few others are without power while the rest of those around you still have power. Um, the other case uh, that is also very common, though it may make very good logical sense to any individual that I'm going down a street, so everybody on the street's probably fed from the same line. That is not always true, and that's not true for various reasons. Sometimes neighborhoods or subdivisions are developed um, over a number of years. Uh, therefore, as we make plans to provide service for the homes in that subdivision, one line may be fed a certain way, and another line may come from a different direction. Uh, so it could be as simple as you're fed from a different line than the house next to you. That's also a common occurrence. Um, and it, it's not really, it doesn't mean anything good or bad. It's just the reality of sometimes how we have to go about building our plant. Um, so sometimes it's because there's a specific issue for you or you and your immediate, uh, immediate neighbors. And sometimes it's just because of an anomaly in the way things are fed that you in fact may be affected while those proximal to you are not. Another thing, uh, worth mentioning. Um, sometimes we hear, well, you know, I noticed that uh, everyone in my subdivision or my neighborhood or myself and the homes on my road, we all had a, a blink or our lights went out for a few seconds, but then most of them came back on, but I'm still sitting here in the dark. Mm -hmm. um, that is a normal way that our system cleanses itself from short circuit conditions. So we will have a case sometimes where um, there is a specific system problem near your home, um, but to rid the system of that short circuit, the entire circuit itself will blink a few times and eventually the fuse clearing, the fuse that um, serves your particular home will clear itself from the system. So then after that specific issue is isolated, then the circuit itself will close back in and remain closed. Um, so that, that, I know that's probably hard for people who are not necessarily electrically inclined to understand, but that is a very, very normal way for our system to cleanse itself of any short circuit issues while also affecting as few of people as possible on a more uh, permanent basis. We have that very temporary concern uh, for the masses, but we get it down to as few as possible for that extended outage. Right. I've all often heard since I started here, if it, if it blinks, that's a good thing because we're trying really hard to make sure that people who don't have to be out aren't. So that was how it right. was. <laughs> Um, so uh, when, when we do have a bigger outage, um, obviously we have members who, um, who rely on medical devices uh, that, that need power. Um, and obviously that's a concern for us. Um, we're always trying to do what we can for all of our members. But I, want, I would like for you to speak to that just for a second about um, you know, what, what we are able to do and then what, what we really need the members to do uh, to make sure that that uh, is consistent for them. We have a number of members who have a medical necessity, uh, whether they're on oxygen or some other sort of life-sustaining apparatus. Whenever those people um, 
have a underlying medical condition like that and they have a medical necessity, we do ask that they let us know because we log on their account that, that there is life sustaining equipment in this home um, and we need to do everything that we can to restore this as, as quickly as possible. Now, it doesn't mean that we take our sweet time on people who don't have a medical necessity, but it means in certain circumstances, if two outages are exactly the same, except one has a medical necessity, yes, we will prioritize that medical necessity. Uh, that is the prudent thing to do. And I think that, that any member would understand that that is a responsible thing to do for the good of our communities. Um, what I want to make sure that people understand though, if you have an account and you have told us that you have a medical necessity, it does not mean that in every specific situation, we can treat your challenge before we get to anybody else. The reality is your account may be one of 300 circuit that is affected. So we cannot necessarily deal with a specific concern for you without dealing with the larger, more global concern of getting that entire circuit back on. Mm -hmm. um, we're gonna prioritize in every circumstance that is logically reasonable to so, but there are cases where the concern is large enough, the, the very localized level of that specific residence cannot be addressed in a vacuum without dealing with the larger problem first. Right. And I do want to make sure people understand that because I wouldn't want anybody to have um, the notion that no matter what, we're going to take care of those with a medical necessity first. We're going to do everything we can to, but sometimes there are reasons that that's just not, it's not practical. Right. Um, so with that being said, we're going to make every effort we can compared to industry norms. We have exceptionally high availability uptime of power on the Nolan system. Our reliability scores are historically uh, quite good, are getting better. Um, anything could happen at any given time that causes us to have a really bad day, a really bad week, a really bad year. But I am very confident in the system that we have built, people that we have making a response for restoration. However, we can't guarantee 100% uptime. And for that reason, Anyone who has a medical necessity, I strongly encourage to have a backup plan beyond no one's going to take care of me. We're going to do everything we can to take care of you. But please, please, for your own good and the well being of those you love, have another contingency plan. Whether that is having uh, UPS or battery backup for some of these critical devices, having a small generator to serve you know, just a few circuits in your home or the specific device in question that you need for, for life sustenance, or, um, or perhaps it will be that you just know you're going to go to a family member's home or um, a neighbor's home or something like that. Please have a backup plan and um, we're going to get there just as soon as we can to help you. And keeping in mind that a medical necessity may be on this circuit and there also might be another one on another circuit. So being able to prioritize becomes a lot more complicated the more people that, that we have that have them yeah. across the system. That's right, exactly. So, um, so obviously our, ours is a partnership with our members. Um, you know, we, we do everything that we can, uh, but also know that our, our members are our partners in, in helping to make sure that, that we don't have issues. Uh, and one of those things that, that we really rely on members for is to help us prevent outages to begin with. Um, and I know that, that our, our right of ways and uh, vegetation kind of really can play a lot into that. So can you, can you give some just basic tips for what a member can do to, to try and avoid an outage, if at all possible, from their end? Well, believe it or not, um, the membership as a whole plays a much larger role in avoiding outages than any individual may realize. First and foremost, if you believe that you see a hazardous condition, a hazardous circumstance, or something just doesn't look right with a pole or a wire, a uh, transformer, um, you know, there's maybe there's an oil spill in your backyard underneath the pole. Well, we definitely need to know about that. Maybe a pole is leaning badly or has um, 
it's split because it's just old deteriorated wood or, you know, peckers going to town on it or something like that. Let us know those things. Um, we will come check all of those out. Now, it may be after our review that we realize, okay, this situation isn't ideal, but this is something that we can, we can live with that does not need immediate attention. We may, we may realize that we're just not going to do anything at that particular time, uh, but we will come review those concerns when you bring them to us, because lots of times they are something that needs immediate attention, and we would not have necessarily known about it in time to do something promptly if you hadn't made us aware. So we appreciate your all's contributions in that regard for sure. Um, furthermore, right of way vegetation management is an imperfect science and an ongoing challenge that all electric utilities have. Um, so we're not unique in the sense that it's a challenge for us, it's a challenge for everyone, but we are actively engaged in doing everything we can to make it better and make it as good as it possibly can be. The two things that I would ask of the membership is if we are on your premises, at your home, your farm, et cetera, and we need to clear our right of way to maintain our lines so that when we have a wind event or a heavy rain event, this thing doesn't fall across the line and cause you or hundreds of other people to be without power, we're gonna do everything we can and do better to try to explain that to you and work with you as much as possible. But please be receptive to our need to cut trees. Um, again, we're not, we're not gonna come to your house and just start hauling off and cutting things down, but please be receptive to that discussion. Uh, secondly, please, for your good and for, for our benefit and for the common good, do not plant trees under power lines because power lines all follow property lines. That is a very typical thing for people to do. And I get it. I mean, you plant, you want to plant a tree, you eat some private buffer for your property. Uh, and often you'll put those on a property line. Please do not do that. It might not be a concern now, but 20 or 25 years from now, it is going to be a concern. And then whether that is you or someone else, you're going to, probably have some issues with, well, this was an issue for the last 20 years, but now it's an issue for no Lynn. Well, now it's growing up in the line. So we've talked a lot about um, a lot of stuff around outages and power restoration. And um, so we, in our partnership with our members, it, obviously restoration is a big part of our job, but also communicating with you is a big part of our job and vice versa. Uh, and we take that really seriously about communicating everything that we can to help our membership feel informed and included uh, when we do have an outage event. So I wanna talk a little bit about just how people can know um, whether you have an outage. Uh, obviously, if you're home, you're gonna know your power's out. You may not be home um, or just updates on that. Um, what are some of the things, and, and obviously some of that comes out of, out of my office with communications, but uh, some of the ways that we have really tried to improve our communication with our members about this? Sure. So we've, we've enabled a few technologies over the last year or two. So anyone who has a smart hub account. So if you have a, if you're an Olin member and you pay a bill, if you'll just sign up and for smart hub, that is an interface that you use to pay your bill and do many other things to get information on your account. You can turn on uh, text message alerts or email alerts through that portal that will allow you to get um, immediate information if in fact there is an outage uh, with your meter or when restoration is made on your meter. Uh, so that's, that's one way that's a really passive way to stay informed about what is happening. Mm -hmm. um, there is also our IVR system. Uh, during a storm event, um, you can call in and get information as to the status of your account. Now to be fair, when we had the ice storm a couple of years ago, that was the thing that was not working as well as it needed to. We were erroneously reporting restorations in some cases when we should not have. We have worked to resolve those concerns. I'm confident that, that is improved, um, but that is another way that you could get that information from us. 
or if you're if you're someone who spends time with social media, Sarah, you do a good job of providing very regular updates uh, on Facebook uh, and a few other platforms, I believe. Um, we also have the website, uh, so we have an outage map on our website, and there is information there that you can get in a more general sense, maybe not granular to your specific uh, to your specific home or business, but you can see globally. Yeah, Nolan's got uh, 2,000 outages right now, or 500, or maybe you're the only one. Um, you would be able to see that on the outage map. Right. Uh, so try to make that available in several different places, and, and hopefully that's reaching most of our membership. One, one of the newest things you were talking about, some of the technologies we've, we've instituted, um, one of the brand new things that we've been able to do is have people text. Now, you have to make sure on your... Again, on your account, you have to have updated information. That's really important, especially when we're mm -hmm. trying to communicate with you. Uh, but if you uh, put a cell phone number attached to your account, especially through Smart Hub, you can text um, the word status to 768482. And we have that up on our social media. We'll have it on our website, uh, 768482. If you text status, we'll let you know if we've seen an outage on your account. So if you're not sure, we know that you're out. All you have to do is text status to that number and it's going to say we show an outage on your account or not. Um, and then if you say, well, I am out, but you're not showing an outage, then you text that same number out and that gives us an indication that you have an outage. So uh, that's an even easier way. Uh, you don't have to you don't have to call in uh, even the IVR system for that. Obviously, if we if you have if you heard a loud uh, bang or if you you know, you have a big pull down across your yard. Those kinds of things are still important to report to our IVR system. But if it's just an outage and you see, okay, I don't, I don't have power. I didn't hear anything. There's nothing important I need to tell you. Uh, just text status to that and we'll let you know uh, that we, that yes, we know that you're out and you know that we're working on it. So uh, these technologies will only continue to get better, but we're really excited about having those available uh, for our members. And again, all of that is on our social media. It'll be on our website. Um, all of that information is on there. So if, if anybody's curious, they can just check those out and uh, we'll keep all of that stuff updated as well. So, And I just want to reiterate to all of the membership, I don't want to discourage anyone from calling in with information uh, during an outage circumstance. Things like there was an explosion in my backyard, I heard a loud bang, there's a line down on the road in front of my home. Those are all very, very valuable pieces of information. So please absolutely make an effort to let us know if you have that type of specific detail. Mm -hmm. I just want to make sure everybody understands that to call in and say, I live at 123 Bacon Creek Road and my power is out. We do know that part. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't, I, don't want, I don't want anyone to go to trouble that is unnecessary for them. But certainly, please give us more detailed information if you have it, because that often expedites restoration. Right. All right. Well, Greg, um, I know I've, I've picked your brain a lot about this, so I appreciate you sitting down and talking about it. Is there anything you think that we've missed or, or anything you want to kind of, kind of wrap up with? I don't think so. I, I'm, I'm looking at my notes right now, and I think that we covered every single thing that I wrote down. Um, it's kind of timely that I'm looking out my office window right now and the remnants of Hurricane Laura are uh, starting to enter our airspace. Uh, so hopefully this is a timely podcast for our members as we, as we approach a season where we're probably going to have some weather events. Hopefully they're not uh, largely debilitating or concerning for us and it's minimal stuff, but I think that these are good things for the members to understand and hopefully it creates more awareness about the challenges we encounter during these situations and also the way we go about trying to do the right thing for all of you. All right. Well, thanks again for all your uh, wisdom and knowledge. And thank you for tuning in uh, again with us for Wire to Wire with Nolan RECC.